Good morning, everyone. Hope you had a good weekend. Are you able to hear me? Am I too loud? Are you able to hear me? Is it clear enough? Yes, ma'am, we are able to hear you. Thank you. Okay, before we begin class today, can uh, uh, one of you lead us in prayer, please? Aradna, can you lead us in prayer this morning? Uh, thank you, Father God, for this time, for this day, Lord. Has you given us, Lord, whatever we learn, Lord, help to, uh, 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 help to, Lord, uh, help to, Lord, receive in our mind, Lord. Fill us with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord, whatever we learn, Lord, help us to do in, in our work, work, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Aradna. Okay, uh, last Monday we were uh, studying chapter 7, uh, the purpose of the incarnation. And uh, we, uh, we looked at uh, incarnation quite a bit in chapter 6 as well uh, and chapter 5. But in this chapter, chapter 7, the purpose of incarnation, we try to summarize the why of the incarnation. Uh, by answering uh, a few questions. And the question that we looked at was, what was the purpose of incarnation? Why did Christ have to become a man and take on the fullness of humanity? Uh, what was going through, uh, you know, what was God doing through the humanity of Christ that he could not do by any other means? And uh, why did Jesus have to partake in flesh and blood? And why did he have to share in our humanity? So we looked at these questions and we tried answering these questions. And uh, we basically summarized the why of the incarnation. And before we uh, ended class, we looked at the divine exchange. Okay, we, I just read it out. Uh, so I'd just like you all to take a couple of minutes and... Uh, you know, uh, just um, uh, read through this um, this entire um, uh, points on the divine exchange. For those of you who don't have your notes, I'll just put it up on the screen uh, so that you can read it. It's... Uh, it's there on your screen, so please... Uh, Take a couple of minutes to just read through the divine um, uh, exchange. And if you have any questions, any doubts, then uh, we'll discuss. Okay, just take a couple of minutes, please, to read through uh, the divine exchange and put it up on the screen here. Hi, good morning, Jacqueline. Thank you for joining us. I just put up uh, the points on divine exchange on the screen. Just take a couple of minutes to read that, please. If you are done, if you could just type in the chat section, done, then you know if you can read that.
You finish reading. Thank you. Okay, so we basically ended chapter seven uh, when we were talking about the Mayoga incarnation uh, by looking at uh, that whole purpose of the incarnation is summed up in Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse nine, where it says, "For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich." Okay. So Christ became poor for our sake so that through his poverty, that is through his incarnation, you know, that we could become rich. And uh, these are the areas where the divine exchange is taking place. Uh, any of you have any questions on this? We looked at it last week. I just read through it. Uh, but if you're having questions, any doubts in lesson seven and based on the divine exchange, you can unmute your mics and ask or you can type in the chat section. Any doubts, any questions? Okay, if not, uh, we'll move on to chapter eight. Uh, I hope again chapter seven was clear and uh, this divine exchange that you just read through now is clear as well. Thank you. Okay, so we will uh, look at chapter 8, the virginal conception, okay. Uh, in this chapter, we are going to briefly discuss about Christ's virginal conception. Uh, for that, I would like one of you to read uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and uh, someone else can read Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38, okay. You want to get in, uh, Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his call his name Emmanuel. Thank you, Sinopoli. Uh Someone else can read Luke, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. Luke chapter 1 verses 26 to verses 38. Now in the sixth month of six month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and was have and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored, one the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at, at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call, him, call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. The, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. 
Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month of her, who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the main servant of the Lord. Let it be me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Thank you, Sri Kim. Uh, so here we see that, you know, uh, regarding the virginal conception of Christ, there has been a lot of controversies about people accepting it, and people debating on it, people giving their own uh, versions. Uh, and, uh, you know, the term virginal conception is much preferred uh, rather than uh, the commonly used uh, uh, term virgin birth, okay? So why is virginal conception uh, preferred to virgin birth? It's because the miracle was in the conception and not in the manner of birth, okay? So uh, Mary conceived to the power of the Holy Spirit. So that was the miracle that took place and it was not in the manner of um, birth. And we read in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 uh, that the Lord will give a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name uh, Emmanuel. Now the Hebrew word, uh, Isaiah is basically in the Old Testament, so it was written in Hebrew. The Hebrew word for virgin is al uh, and it's translated either as young woman or virgin. And that is where, uh, you know, one of the controversies or one of the misunderstandings or the arguments are based on is because the Hebrew word for uh, uh, what is used in uh, virgin in uh, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 is al and it means either young woman or Virgin. Okay, so therefore the questions have been raised about whether this verse really supports the virginal conception or not. But when we look at uh, uh, Matthew and uh, the Gospel of uh, Matthew and Luke, uh, we see that in their gospel accounts they use the Greek word patrinos, which means virgin. Okay, it does not mean young woman, but the Greek word patrinos means uh, virgin, okay? So we, uh, the virginal conception of Christ uh, can be understood from the fact that it is a miraculous, it was through the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit who brought about it, okay? And we know that uh, this virginal conception is something that is unscientific, uh, cannot prove scientifically, it violates all natural laws, uh, but we know that, you know, in we read in Luke chapter uh, 1 that, you know, the last uh, phrase in verse 37, it says, for with God, nothing is impossible, okay? Uh, we know that God created the entire universe. Uh, there was nothing. The earth was formless. It was empty. It was dark. But we know that God created everything that we see to the power of his word. And so it's... Uh, and we also created Adam and Eve, uh, you know, Adam from the dust of the earth, he created Eve uh, also the same way, and we took a rib and then he created Eve. So we see that nothing is impossible uh, with God. And, uh, you know, so also this miraculous uh, conception uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit uh, in Mary's womb is also a miracle. And we see that, uh, you know, even though it's unscientific and violates all natural laws. It is something that, uh, you know, God ordained, God foresaw, God wanted to do it that way, and we know that nothing is impossible with uh, God, okay? So, if you look at your notes, the virginal conception is uh, very short and brief there, but I would just like to add a few more points, so if you would like to take down notes, you're welcome to do so. Uh, we look at the doctrinal importance of the virgin birth, uh, at least we will look at it in two areas. Okay, the first thing, uh, the virginal conception shows us or reveals to us that salvation is ultimately only from the Lord. Okay, only God can give us, uh, provide us salvation. Uh, just as God had promised in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, uh, we looked at this verse uh, uh, in our previous chapters where the seed of the woman would ultimately destroy 
the serpent, and we see the fulfillment of that uh, in Christ, Christ, who is the seed of the woman, a born of the woman. And so God brought it about by his own power and not through human effort, because salvation is not the work of man, it's not the effort of man, but it's, uh, you know, it is only through God that we can receive salvation. And we see that God brought it about by his own power and not through human effort. So the virginal conception or the virgin birth of Christ reminds us that salvation can never come through human effort. Uh, it's only the work of God himself. Um, and our salvation comes only through the supernatural uh, work of God. And uh, that was it's very evident um, from the very beginning in Jesus' life. As we read in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 5. Can one of you please read Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, please? Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under, uh, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of the son. Thank you. So here we see that, uh, you know, at God's appointed time, the Kairos time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, uh, to redeem those who are under the law uh, so that we can be part of his family, so that we can be called his sons and uh, daughters. Okay, so here we see that, uh, uh, you know, God did this so that you know, salvation is the work of God, it's something supernatural, it's not the work of man, cannot be accomplished through man's human effort, and so God brought about this uh, miraculous virginal conception so that he could bring about salvation and save uh, the entire mankind. So that is uh, one area that we can look at uh, regarding the doctrinal uh, you know, uh, concept of virginal uh, conception. The second thing is that the virginal conception made it uh, possible for uniting uh, the full deity and full humanity in one person. Okay, so the virginal conception made it possible for uh, uniting the full deity and the full humanity in one uh, person. Okay, and we see that this was the means that God used uh, to send his son. Uh, we read in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, God so loved the world that he gave uh, us his uh, son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal Right? So God used this to send his son into the world as a man. Okay? So if we think of other possible ways in which Christ uh, might have come to the earth, none of them could clearly unite uh, deity and humanity in one person. Okay? Uh, it probably would have been possible for God to create you know, Jesus as a a human being in heaven itself and then send him directly uh, to earth to descend down from heaven to earth like he ascended from you know uh, earth to heaven he could have created uh, you know Jesus as a complete human being in heaven and you know uh, have him descend down to earth uh, you know without any human pairing that means he wouldn't have been born to any human parent because he's already created as a human being but then, if he had done that, it would have been very hard for us to see how Jesus could be fully human as we are, uh, nor would he be part of the human race um, that physically descended from uh, Adam. So we see that, you know, the genealogy of Jesus, he descended from Adam, uh, and the promise that was uh, the prophecy that came, uh, that he would come in the line of David, uh, and uh, through Abraham, through the line of David, and uh, he would be bring uh, blessings to the Gentiles. Okay, so we also, as Gentiles, uh, we can uh, be grafted into the tree of life, into the, the blessings 
of the covenant that God established with Abraham, we can be part of that. It's because of Jesus and because that he came in the same race as Adam, as uh, Abraham, and he came uh, to establish the throne of um, uh, David. So all of these prophecies will come in fulfillment with what uh, you know God has said. Uh, if Jesus was born here on this earth through um, a, a woman, but if he had been created as a human being and just sent down to uh, descend to earth, then you know uh, he would not be fully human as we are, nor would be he be part of the human race that physically descended from um, Adam. Okay, so we see that in Adam, the first Adam, sin entered the world, but in the last Adam, you know. Uh, the last Adam conquered sin, overthrew sin. Uh, we see that uh, Paul saying uh, and writing that you know through the first uh, Adam death reigned, but uh, uh, through the last Adam you know uh, life uh, reigned and death was uh, was nullified, was uh, completely uh, taken away. Okay, so you know God could have done that, but that would have not served the purpose. Um, then uh, it would have, uh, you know, on the other hand, probably uh, it would have been possible for God to have Jesus come into to the world through, uh, you know, Adam, uh, sorry, through uh, Joseph and Mary. Uh, and then after he was born, you know, his full divine nature could be miraculously united in his uh, human nature at some point. Uh, you know, uh, early in his life. But if God had done that, then it would have been very hard for us to understand uh, how Jesus was fully God, uh, since his origins would have been like us in every way. That means if he's born to human parents, both to, you know, uh, Joseph and Mary, then uh, he would have been born in sin. Uh, that is, you know, uh, the terms referred to as original sin. Uh, because we are all born in sin, because uh, our parents are sinful and we're born in a sinful way. So, you know, we could never identify with him or understand how he could be uh, fully uh, divine. So God did not do this as well. He did not have human parents to uh, you know, give birth to Jesus and then uh, in a miraculous way, uh, you know, um, uh, in a miraculous way, at some point in his early life, just unite the full uh, divinity of uh, of Jesus into in his human nature. And if he had done that, you know, uh, we would never be able to understand his full uh, divinity, his full deity, because he would be uh, just like us in every way. That means he would be born in sin. Okay. So when we think about these two possibilities, it helps us to understand. How God, in His wisdom, uh, ordained a combination of human and divine influence in the birth of Christ, so that His full humanity uh, and His full uh, uh, divinity would be, uh, you know, clearly seen in the fact of His ordinary human birth uh, from a human mother, in which we can see His full humanity and His full deity would be evident from the fact of his conception in Mary's womb by the power of the Holy Spirit. So God in his divine uh, wisdom, in his divine knowledge, uh, thought about this, though it, for us it seems very unscientific. It uh, seems to violate all natural laws. Uh, but in God's uh, wisdom, in his understanding, this was the best way he could bring about, uh, uh, you know, um, God becoming man uh, in a sinless way so that, uh, you know, he can pay the full penalty uh, for the sins of for mankind and hence uh, please God uh, or please God with his, the full sufficient sacrifice uh, that he made, okay? So this was the best possible way uh, that, you know, through the virginal conception uh, in Mary's womb, uh, it was through the power of the Holy Spirit and hence we see humanity and divinity, uh, you know, uh, uh, fully accomplished in the person of Jesus Christ, okay? Now, it will be difficult for people to understand this, believe it, uh, but why should we believe this? Because simply because scripture affirms it, 
And also we saw in Luke chapter 1 verse 37, he says, nothing is impossible by God. Uh, uh, certainly such miracles is not too hard for God, uh, who created the universe and everything, um, you know, through the power of his word, created uh, man, the dust of the earth. And uh, we also see he affirms that nothing is impossible by him. So original conception was not an impossibility. Um, okay. Um, uh, so if we don't believe it, it's we are just confessing uh, our own unbelief in the God of the Bible. Okay. Um, so in addition to the fact that scripture teaches us or affirms a virginal conception, uh, we see that it is doctrinally important uh, that we are to understand the biblical teaching uh, on the person and the work of Jesus Christ correctly. And it's important that we begin or to, uh, when once, you know, we begin to affirm or understand or believe in the virginal conception, then we will be able to understand and uh, correctly interpret, correctly, uh, you know, minister or uh, uh, understand the biblical teaching on the person of Christ correctly. Okay. So that is about virginal conception where well, it was, uh, the notes there are very short, but I just added in some more points uh, for our understanding. Uh, any questions on this? So just added the whole thing about why did God not just create a human being and uh, send him here on earth? And I said that if he had done that, you know, we could not fully really understand Jesus as a human because he's not really fully part of us. He would not have come in the line of Adam. Okay. Uh, and hence, we will not be able to understand uh, him. He will not be able to understand us. God revealing, uh, God revealing himself to us and trying to understand our human nature as well. And we saw that, um, you know, if uh, God would have, uh, you know, had a uh, Jesus born through the normal course, through her uh, husband and wife, then we would see that if then we would know and put in his divinity at, uh, you know, into his humanity at uh, some point very early in his life, uh, we would not be able to understand how he is fully God because he would have been born in sin just like each one of us are born in sin. And that would not have accomplished the purpose uh, because it was only a sinless person who could take on the sins of the entire Any questions, any doubts? Okay, so Bashi says that he's not able to hear properly. Uh, he's having, is uh, the rest of you able to hear me clearly? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you clearly. Okay. Thank you, Siddhikuni. Uh, so Subhash is going to have to worry, uh, maybe what you can do is, um, uh, at the end of the day, decided by 5 o'clock, uh, the video, uh, the lecture video will be posted on uh, the stream page in your Google Classroom. Uh, you have access to all the videos that have been brought so far, so you can go back and listen to it. Okay. But uh, if you have not heard anything and you still have any questions, uh, you're free to ask. You can type it in the chat section. No questions? Oh, Paul too says he can't hear properly. Okay. Silutoni, can you hear me clearly? Uh, it's not that clear, but it's okay. Oh. Uh, what about uh, Rubega and Abu Bakr? Are you able to hear me? It's very clear, ma'am. Okay, clear. Yes, uh, Enoch, go ahead. It's not that clear, ma'am. It's echoing. Oh, it's echoing. Then I will reduce my volume. Now is it uh, clear again? It's okay now. It's okay now. Nothing better. Yes. Okay. Okay. 
Some of you can hear me clearly, for some of you it's... Now is it okay? Um, success, can you hear me clearly? Yes, it's okay now. Okay, thank you. Paul, now can you hear me clearly? Okay, uh, if you have missed any points, then maybe you want to ask again, you can ask, or you can type it in the chat section and I'll explain it. Anything that you missed out uh, in the points I said? Literally? It's okay, ma'am, you can proceed. Okay. Okay, then let's move on to, if there are no questions and no doubts, we'll move on to chapter 9. Okay, uh, the sinless lamb. Uh, now we've looked at the person of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, we will look at his uh, work. Okay, and uh, Jesus Christ is referred to as the sinless lamb. Uh, we look at uh, Jesus being referred to as the lamb over 30 times in the New Testament. Um, so in this chapter, we're going to consider this title and the role of Christ, uh, both from the Old and New Testament perspective. We cannot understand uh, Jesus being the Lamb of God just from the New Testament perspective. Uh, we have to look at it from the New Testament, uh, Old Testament perspective as well so that we can gain a better understanding, okay? Uh, where does it uh, mention in uh, the New Testament that Jesus is the Lamb of God? Who, who calls him as the Lamb of God? Who remember? John the Baptist. Ma'am, John 1.29. Thank you, Rosalind. Thank you, John. Um, yes, it's John the Baptist in John chapter 1, verse 29. Can one of you read John chapter 1, verse 29, please? John chapter 1 verses 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the lamp of God who takes away the sin of the world. Thank you. So Jesus came as a lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Uh, now the Jewish people were very familiar with this word lamb. Why were they familiar with this word lamb? Ma'am, maybe because the lamp is used to sacrifice? Yes, thank you. Uh, because of uh, the lamb that was used in the sacrificial offering, and we you know that the entire uh, uh, you know, life, uh, religious or spiritual life of the Israelites revolved around uh, the sacrifices uh, and around the law that they had to keep the commandments, the laws, and the sacrifices. That was, you know, the whole. Uh, religious activity or their religious life revolved around uh, these three things. So hence they knew about uh, uh, the land was very, uh, you know, uh, familiar to them. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it was part of the rituals uh, like we will look at in our study and we also studied that, uh, you know, in, in the previous chapters. Okay. Um, now there's only a way in which a land could take away the sin of a person or, the, or, or Jesus being the Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world, it's only through uh, sacrifice. Okay, it's to put into death because uh, you know, life for life, uh, the penalty for sin is death, and hence, you know, um, uh, we have to face the consequences of the penalty for sin, which is uh, uh, death. So, it is important to know that Jesus uh, came to take away the sins of the whole world. Uh, it was not just the sins of um, the nation of Israel, or it was not just uh, the sins of Christians that Jesus dealt with, but we know that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Okay, so it was, he died for the sins of the entire uh, whole world. And so we see that Jesus had to take our place and he died in our place because the penalty for sin is death and, uh, you know, uh, uh, breaking of the covenant uh, promise is life for life, okay? 
And so the person has to take, uh, has to die. And we see that even in the Old Testament sacrifice, the lamb had to be slain. The lamb has to be killed. And the, and the blood that sig signifies, this, uh, signifies the life uh, has to be poured on the altar uh, as an atonement or a covering for the, si for the sin of the person or the sins of the entire um, uh, nation of Israel. Okay. Now we look at uh, the Passover lamb. Uh, that is where the first institution of sacrifice came. And where did the Passover lamb happen? Or the first Passover festival happen? Exodus, when Israelites were coming, were coming out of Egypt. Okay, thank you. We will read this in Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. Uh, and uh, this happens in Egypt. Uh, this is one of uh, the last plagues, the plague of the uh, firstborn. And before the plague of the firstborn happens, uh, we see God uh, telling Moses, uh, you know, uh, how the Israelites had to, uh, you know, uh, choose the lamb, what kind of lamb, how they had to sacrifice it. And um, what this whole meaning of this whole Passover festival meant, and how they are to follow it through uh, uh, generations. So, can one of you read Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 14, please? Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 to 14. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. In the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginnings of your month, it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamp, according to the house of the of the, his father, a lamp for his household. And if the household is too small for the lamp, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of this person, according to his each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamp. Your lamp shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you may take it from the sheep or from the goods. Now you shall keep it on the 14 days of this same month. Then the whole assembly of congregation of Israel shall kill it to a, to a light and they shall take on some of the blood and put it on the two door spots and on the light lighted of the house where they eat it then they shall heat and the flesh on that on that night roasted in fire with unlevel bread unlevel bread and with bitter herb they shall heat it. Do not eat the raw, nor boil at with a water, but roasted in fire. It's head with legs and entry. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remain of it, what remain of it on the, on the, until you shall burn it with fire, and thus you shall heat it with a belt on your waist you shall your scandal on your feet and your staff in your head so you shall heat it in the east it is the lord passover for i was for i will pass through the land of egypt on that night and we strike at strike all the firstborn in the land of egypt both man and beast and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment, and I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you, and on the house houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and I will plague sharp, and the plague shall not come, shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generation. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Amen. Thank you.
Uh, so here we see that God is preparing to deliver his people, uh, the Hebrew people, the Israelite people, out of uh, slavery in Egypt. And uh, he has a plan uh, to lead them to the promised land, the long land that he has uh, you know, prepared for them, a land that he has promised uh, to give them uh, to their forefathers, uh, Abraham. Okay? So at this time, God instituted the feast of the Passover, and he tells them that this feast has to be observed through the, throughout the generations. Uh, and uh, the feast of the Passover is uh, celebrated uh, by the Jews uh, in the first month of the Jewish calendar year, uh, which is sometime between April, uh, March and April 4th, us, okay? The Passover actually spoke or it pointed out uh, to the redemptive work of Christ. So it was a kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, it was a pointer. It was, uh, it was uh, signifying something that would happen in the, in the future. It was foreshadowing what uh, Christ was going to do, the redemptive work of Christ as the Passover uh, lamb. So the New Testament in First Corinthians chapter five verse seven. Uh, uh, can somebody read that, please? First Corinthians chapter five verse seven. First Corinthians chapter five verse seven. First Corinthians 5 verses 7. Get rid of the old east, that you may be new bath without east, as you really are, for our Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. So here we see that uh, First Corinthians 5 7 tells us that Christ is our past reward and a sacrifice uh, for us. Uh, in the Old Testament, the piece of the Passover uh, is uh, a type and the shadow of uh, the redemptive work of Christ. It basically pointed out on its spoke. It was it's also a type and a shadow of the redemptive work of Christ that we see in the uh, New Testament. Okay, the Old Testament Passover lamb is also a figure of Christ who is the true Passover lamb. And uh, the Old Testament Passover piece pointed to what uh, this true lamb of God uh, would be like and what he would accomplish. Okay? Uh, there is an important characteristic of this Passover lamb, which we clearly see in Christ. Now, when God tells them to uh, choose the lamb, what kind of lamb does he ask them to choose for uh, the Passover feast? What kind of lamb did he ask them to choose? Then the lamb of the first year. Okay, the lamb of the first year and also? Without blemish and without spot. Yes, without blemish and uh, without um, a spot. A male lamb, a year old, without blemish and without spot. Now, if you look at, uh, read the Old Testament, uh, the books of Exodus and Leviticus, which talks about, Leviticus basically talks about all uh, the sacrifices that, that has to be made. Uh, there's repeatedly this phrase that occurs, you know, uh, uh, the animal that has to be presented for the sacrifice should not be, uh, you know, uh, lame or sick or without any blemish. It has to be perfect, okay? And we see that uh, the Israelites fail to even keep this uh, so-called requirement of the sacrifice and uh, God holds it against them. We read this in Haggai and Malachi says, you know, uh, you bring me a sick and lame and diseased animals and he says, uh, you know, you take it to your governors, will they accept that? They will not. See, and when they don't, how can you bring it to me? I am God. So we read that uh, and God holds it against them because, you know, uh, they were bringing uh, sick, blemished, um, and lame animals for uh, sacrifice. But here we see that the lamb should be without blemish. Uh, we read this in Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. Um, so the lamb that had to be used for the Passover feast and uh, still be used 
uh, by the Jews, even as they celebrate the Passover, means it should be one that is without uh, blemish. That means it had to be something that was uh, perfect, complete, uh, healthy, whole, and uh, spotless. Okay, and we see that Jesus was also, um, uh, you know, uh, made this uh, full sufficient sacrifice because he was a lamb without any blemish and without any spot. We read this in First Peter chapter one. Verse 19, can one of you read that, please? First Peter, chapter 1, verse 19. One Peter, uh, one nineteen, but with but with the precious blood of Christ as mm. of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Thank you, Sinatoni. So here it tells us that Christ was that perfect lamb who made the perfect sacrifice because he was without blemish and without spot. So what do we mean that Christ was without blemish or without spot? Does it mean that he was not sick, he was poor, he was not physically disabled? What does it mean? Yes, go ahead. He touched Ma'am, he was sinless and holy. Okay, thank you. Yes, Rubega. Ma'am, I rest my case. So the Kana has answered it. <laughs> Okay, yeah, it was uh, sinless, pure, and um, holy. Okay, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. Uh, can one of you read that, please? 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. First John chapter 3, verses 5. But you know that he appeared so, so he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Thank you. So here we see that he was manifested to take away our sin. Christ, you know, manifesting in the flesh to take away our sins. And why could he take away the sins of the whole world? Because in him there was no sin. He was a lamb without blemish. And uh, we see that Christ's sinlessness, uh, you know, uh, is illustrated in him being a lamb without blemish, that means he was someone who was perfect and someone who was pure and holy, okay? So, uh, uh, he was the perfect lamb without blemish and this illustrates Christ's sinlessness, which means that he was perfect and pure. Okay, any questions on this thus far? What we have done? What we have looked at? Christ is the Passover lamb. Any questions on this point? No? Okay, we'll pause here. We'll take a break um, and we'll come back after the break and continue with that. Okay?